That's always a good little bit of exercise right before the message. To run up into the balcony and get everything running. And then run up to the sound room and get everything running. And make it here before the fifth verse. And I was expecting the hymn to be played a little slower. <laughs> anyway, praise the Lord, we made it. We're in Acts chapter 13. In Acts chapter 13 tonight. The message entitled, God Haters Actually Fulfill Bible Prophecy. Acts chapter 13, we'll be looking at verses 28 and 29 tonight. Let's join together in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your sovereign, predestinating will that guarantees that even those who hate you will in fact do precisely what you have ordained so that you can bring to pass all those things which you have promised. We know that all things, not most things, work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. And the all things include the evil things of life. And there are those whom you have foreordained to damnation who fulfill those things so that you will ultimately receive the greatest amount of glory and your people will receive the greatest amount of good. It's a difficult doctrine, Father, and yet we see, as you have clearly stated in Scripture, and as we put together the pieces that you have given to us, that truly it is the all things, not merely some things, not merely good things, not merely those who are the elect being elect, but also those who are the non-elect, specifically chosen for purposes within your plan that we may not understand, but by which you will receive glory for your holiness, your justice, your righteousness, and your fulfillment of the destruction of those who rebel against you. We pray, Father, for your blessings on this, your word tonight, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You recall that last week we studied They Knew Him Not, The Cost of Ignorance, and as we looked at those verses there, we saw in the last of the two verses which we were looking at, verses 26 and 27, a very interesting phrase which ties us in with our two verses for tonight. Let me read verse 37 for you to remind you of that. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Interesting. They had a head knowledge. They read the Bible on a very regular basis. They had major portions of it memorized. Every Jewish boy did. And yet, they did not recognize the Messiah. But they fulfilled Scripture. They weren't sitting around saying, now how can we fulfill the next part of the scripture? How can we make sure that it all comes to pass so that everything works out in God's plan? They didn't even know that they were fulfilling scripture. As we are sitting here tonight, we are fulfilling certain things in the sovereign plan of God. We are not here by accident. Nor is it by accident that certain others are not here, though they could be. God has purposes not only for blessing, but God has purposes for judging. God has purposes for edification and the opening of the eyes of some. And God has purposes for condemning and either judging by casting into hell or chastening those who are his children who fail to do what they ought to do. And God foreordains it so that we might fear before him. That's what scripture says. Very sobering thought. You recall that Paul is speaking to a group not only of Jews, but he also mentions that there are God-fearers among them. Those were Gentiles whom the Holy Ghost had awakened to at least three things. To their sinful condition. 
to an awareness that the God of Israel was the true God and not their own idols. And number three, the wrath of God against those who are not in right relationship to him. We talked briefly about how God has communicated these things to the pagan world, the light of creation in Romans 1, the light of conscience in Romans 2, and then finally the light of scripture, which is enough light to not only condemn, but also to save those who will believe it. All men have the light of conscience, all men have the light of creation, but not all men have the light of scripture. You know, when we were in college, I recall years ago, and perhaps you have run into the same question, other students who always want to argue, but what about the heathen in Africa? Well, Romans 1 answers the question that they are certainly under condemnation because they have the light of creation. Romans number 2 answers the question because they do have consciences knowing right from wrong. But the antagonist student will always argue, well, yes, but they don't have the Bible whereby they can trust in Christ and be saved. So what about them? Will God really send all of them to hell? The answer is yes. Because you see, God in his sovereignty raises up men and women throughout history to carry his word to specific locations at specific time in history so that specific men and women and boys and girls will hear the gospel, will be regenerated by the Holy Spirit, drawn irresistibly to Christ, and place their faith in him. But the way in which I usually would answer those people who have that problem, because they were trying to get the focus of the spotlight off of themselves, would be, well, God in his wisdom, if he wishes to do so, can raise up a missionary and send them to any person who would believe. That's not the real issue. The real issue is you have heard. What are you going to do with what you have heard? Don't worry about the heathen in Africa. Your own soul is at stake. You're on your way to hell. What will you do with Christ? Very important point to remember. <clears throat> All men have the light of creation and conscience, and God will guarantee that the scriptures will get to those who are his elect. In particular, we noted that verse 27 said, they didn't know Jesus, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day. And we pointed out the importance of knowing prophetic scripture. In their case, it was important to know the prophetic scripture concerning his first coming. They were focused on the prophetic scriptures concerning his second coming. They were focused on the prophetic scriptures that dealt with the millennium, with the kingdom, with Israel being on top of the heap, with all the nations of the world flowing into Jerusalem. You know, it's rather interesting that today we have a great deal to study in prophetic scriptures, and yet oftentimes we are just the reverse of what the Jews were. They weren't looking at the first coming, though that's what they should have been looking at. They were looking at the second coming. And today, many in the church are all thrilled about the scriptures, and rightly so, concerning his first coming, but they are totally ignorant of the scriptures concerning his second coming. The prophets. We read the prophets quite frequently here in this church. And yet, how many of us are ignorant of what the scripture calls things to come? It seems that men are always focused on the area which is less important than the area that is more important for us at our time. And so we saw that they failed to know the prophets, even though they had actually heard Jesus teach and preach and refer to the prophets over and over in his earthly ministry even though they had seen the messianic miracles that the prophets stated would be the evident sign of the promised Messiah, yet they were not aware of those miracles, not in the sense that <laughs> those were the miracles that pointed to Messiah. Instead, they got angry at his miracles because he frequently performed his miracles on the Sabbath. Oh, how they were stuck on Sabbatarianism. 
and they'd see him do a miracle, and then they'd go off and plot how they could kill him because he had done it on the Sabbath. Dear people, how often we're like that, failing to see what God is doing, and being angry about what God is doing because we have a preconceived idea of what God ought to be doing. Paul says they did not know him. In fact, they crucified him. We talked about would we really know him because all three reasons that the Jews thought they would recognize the Messiah are true of us. We know both what the Old Testament and New Testament say about the coming Messiah, but frequently we try to squeeze him into our own system of theology. Two, we are eagerly expecting the appearing of Messiah at any moment, but not really, because if we were expecting him, we would be living lives of purity and holiness that are required of people who really believe that he could come back at any moment. And thirdly, we pride ourselves in being the right group of people, the chosen ones, the elect, the one to whom the promises are given, when in fact we don't understand the promises because it would change our lives if we did. We saw that the cost of ignorance is eternal damnation, quite a surprise for those who thought they were God's elect, God's chosen people, those Jewish leaders at Jerusalem. We saw what the people tried to do to Jesus in the synagogue at Nazareth in Luke chapter 4 after he pointed out God's work among the Gentiles. They tried to kill him by throwing him off the top of the mountain. They had wrong preconceived ideas about the Messiah that they were not willing to give up. And we see what it cost them. And that brings us to tonight, verses 27 through 29. For they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath day, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. And though they found no cause of death in him, yet desired they, Pilate, that he should be slain. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. Verse 27 and verse 29 both mention the fact that they were fulfilling Scripture in their wicked, evil, rebellious, murderous acts. Fulfilling Scripture when they thought they were pleasing God. Certainly they thought they were solving their own problem with the Romans. The Bible doctrines of predestination and reprobation are clearly seen in our text here tonight. Predestination, let's give a simplified definition of that. Predestination. It means that God has determined the destinies, the eternal destinies of men and angels, all moral creatures, before their creation. Because God determines the destinies, not merely for good, but he predetermines all the destinies of men and women and boys and girls and angels, both those who are what are called the elect angels and those who are the followers of Satan. He has determined their destinies before their creation. The doctrine of predestination includes the doctrine of reprobation. We see both those doctrines in our text tonight, predestination and reprobation, and we learn at least four things from the verses that we've just read. Number one, the Jews at Jerusalem and the Jewish leaders did not recognize Christ when he came, even though they read the Bible constantly. Serious lessons there. Even though they read the Bible constantly, they were spiritually blind and they were spiritually dead. Jesus says so multiple times in his ministry when he talks about them as the blind leaders of the blind and so on. In other words, they were not saved. The second thing that we learn from our text tonight is these unsaved, eternally condemned people actually fulfilled the prophecies that said they would condemn him and crucify him. 
Thirdly, they knew that he was innocent. They didn't recognize him as the Messiah, but the text specifically says that they knew he was innocent. Look at that phrase. They found no cause of death in him. But they still wanted him to be killed. And fourth and finally, and I think this is very fascinating because in the sovereign plan of God, he had some very exciting things down the road. Just a few years later, they got the Gentiles involved in the murder. Because God had predestined Gentiles as well as Jews, and Christ was going to die for Gentiles as well as Jews. You see the phrase there, yet desired they Pilate that he should be slain. They got the Gentiles involved as well. And it had to be through a specific course of events. It had to be a specific type of death. It had to be involving a certain group of people. It was not by accident when, where, and how Jesus died. First, let's look at the issue of spiritual blindness as manifested in the Jews, this first of the four things that we learn from our text. It's very clear that they were not trying to fulfill Bible prophecy and thereby send themselves to hell. If somebody knew he was specifically trying to fulfill Bible prophecy so that he could send himself to hell, he would probably want to go the other way. They had no idea that they were sending themselves to hell and fulfilling Bible prophecy at the same time. The Bible tells us that this spiritual blindness has two different prongs. Number one, it's the result of being spiritually dead. And number two, it is the result of the active work of Satan to keep us in that state, the state of spiritual blindness and deadness. That's why they had no idea that they were fulfilling Bible prophecy. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 15, verse 14. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Now Jesus, as you know, many times in his Miracles, and we find this in all four Gospels, healed people who were blind. John chapter 9, in fact, uh, has a very large incident about Jesus healing the man born blind. And by making blind people physically able to see, Jesus was teaching lessons about spiritual blindness. And in that John 9 passage, there are two verses, three verses, that tell us something about the blind Pharisees. Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said unto him, Are we blind also? Jesus said unto them, If ye were blind, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see. Therefore your sin remaineth. There's a lot packed into those three little verses there. We tend to sort of pass over them. But Jesus is making a statement concerning the making blind of people. He has physically made sighted a blind man. But as he speaks to the Pharisees, he talks about making them blind. Oh, he did not make them blind physically, but he made them blind spiritually. They saw him, they heard him, they saw the miracle. They tried to get the blind man to deny Jesus, but he would not. They called his parents in, and his parents, because they were afraid of being thrown out of the synagogue, said, well, he's of age, ask him. Because we don't want anything to do with this. 
There was a deliberate hatred of the Lord Jesus Christ, a deliberate attempt to deny what they had seen with their physical eyes, but their hearts were hardened. We don't have time to trace all the places in Scripture that talks about that. We're going to be doing some of them with Herod, uh, with excuse me, Pharaoh, but their hearts were hardened. Ephesians chapter two. How did we start out? Did we start out spiritually sick, anemic, on death's bed, or how did we start out? Ephesians two one. And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. The first problem, the first of the two prongs of spiritual deadness and blindness is that's the way we start. It is a choice that God has made based on the fact that we are descended from the first sinner, Adam. As in Adam, all die. Even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But we start in spiritual death, not in spiritual sickness. The second prong that we mentioned is the result of the active work of Satan keeping us in that state. We find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 4. In whom the God of this world, that Satan, hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Satan does everything he can to keep even the blind eyes covered because he does not want them to hear the gospel. He does not want the power of the Holy Spirit to be working and suddenly transforming blind eyes into seeing eyes. Two things stacked against the unsaved person to begin with. And then we find a very fascinating verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 8. There's a lot packed into this verse as well. We start out spiritually blind, spiritually dead. Satan continues to push to keep us in that condition. But would there have been a difference if we were not in that condition, or as the Armenians like to poise us in a free will condition whereby we are able to make the choice for God. Listen to what it says in 1 Corinthians 2.8. Which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, now listen to this phrase, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That is a heavy statement. That last verse that I've just read here in 1 Corinthians 2.8 gives us an insight into what might have been. God on special and very rare occasions in the Bible pulls aside the veil and lets us see things that would indeed have happened if he had chosen a different course for history. And this is one of those times. God did not let the princes of this world see beyond the veil. Nor did he give them a free will to choose a different course rather than the course of redemption that he had planned. If they really knew who Jesus was, they would not have crucified him. Chew on that for a few months. Think about it. They would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But you see, God determined that the Lord of glory had to be crucified. Because men were sinners. And God had a plan that required the shedding of blood. And if Jesus had come that first time, and everybody had understood and believed, there would be no redemption from sin.
They did not know him, nor the prophets, which were read every Sabbath day. If they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Another place we see that same principle at work is when Jesus curses certain cities. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 20. Then began he to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not. Now does he hold them accountable for not repenting? Yes. Does he hold those who crucified him accountable? Or does he say, well, you know, it was a tough break, guys, and so we're going to let you squeeze through anyway because, you know, you really didn't understand and you didn't have a chance. No. Because they repented not. Woe unto thee, Chorazin. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. God cursed Tyre and placed upon it a perpetual curse of being a bare place where fishermen would spread their nets, where every rock of that entire massive city would be thrown into the sea. And today it's still a place where fishermen spread their nets. But if Jesus had done his mighty works in Tyre and Sidon, they would not have been cursed, and they would have still been around at the time of Christ, and they probably would still be around today. But Jesus did not come and do his mighty works in Tyre and Sidon. God could have sent him at any point in history, but God did not. And as a result, there was a group of people in two different towns who were wiped from the face of the earth, and who are in hell. Another illustration he gives. And thou Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shalt be brought down to hell. Jesus is cursing a town and telling the people that live there they're on their way to hell. We don't like to think of Jesus doing that kind of thing, but he is saying to a specific group of people who lived in a specific town at a specific location, at a specific point in history, folks, you are going to end in hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. That's a sobering thought, isn't it? Sodom was destroyed sometime between 2000 and 1800 B.C. when God sent fire from heaven and Lot and his daughters escaped and his wife got turned to a pillar of uh, salt. It would have lasted 2,000 more years, according to Jesus. If Jesus had gone to Sodom, that city filled with Sodomites, that city in which one of the righteous men, because Lot is called a righteous man who vexed his soul from day to day, offered to give them his daughters to rape instead of the two angelic visitors that had come to visit him. That's a perverted city. It would have remained for at least another 2,000 years. Just because Jesus would have done miracles in it. That would have been enough to stick for 2,000 years. Jesus chose not to come in the days of Abraham and do his miracles in Sodom. That's a sovereign divine choice that God had made in the councils of eternity past, which falls under the category of reprobation. The second thing that we see as we have listed the four different things is that although these Jews had a head knowledge of the Bible, 
They did not understand the prophecies that related to Christ and therefore never put it together that they were actually fulfilling those prophecies. And the obvious corollary, that thus they were not elect, but they were reprobate. Did it ever occur to you that Judas fits this category as well? Jesus specifically chose Judas to be the instrument of betrayal and to have, a very technical term used here, to have a special place in hell reserved for Judas. We see in the great declaration of Peter over in John chapter 6 a reference to this. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. <clears throat> How does Jesus answer them? Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve? It wasn't happenstance that Jesus picked the disciples whom he picked. We see God using each of them in special ways throughout his ministry and throughout church history as they went to different places to share the gospel. Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. Judas was a man who saw every miracle that Jesus did. Judas was a man that heard every teaching that Jesus taught. Judas was a man who heard all the conversations and discussions of the disciples. Judas was a man who ate meals with Jesus every day, went every place that Jesus went, heard all the scriptures that Jesus preached, saw all the prophetic fulfillments that Jesus fulfilled. And he was chosen for a purpose. But it was not eternal life. John 17, 12. While I was with them in the world, this is 11 chapters later. This is the high priestly prayer of Jesus. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me, I have kept. The Father had chosen the disciples, and he had given them to Jesus. They were not born a century earlier, a century later, even a year earlier, or a day earlier, or a day later. They were placed in history by God at a very precise moment of time. Listen to the rest of the verse. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Judas was prophesied in the Old Testament. What Judas would do was prophesied in the Old Testament. What kind of character Judas would have was prophesied in the Old Testament because it was determined by God that this man would be the key to betraying Christ. We find that in the book of Acts. <clears throat> Let me read you one more passage out of Luke first, 22, verse 3. Then entered Satan into Judas, named Iscariot, being of the number of the twelve. A man who is going to be possessed by Satan himself, not merely a demon. The demons are the henchmen of Satan, but the number one head honcho. Satan himself entered into Judas when he went out to betray Jesus. The devil didn't want anything falling through the cracks. Now we get to Acts chapter 1, verse 16. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled which the Holy Ghost, by the mouth of David, spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them that took Jesus.
It had to be fulfilled. You see, they didn't know the scriptures of the prophets. Do you know the scriptures of the prophets? Do you spend any time studying the scriptures of the prophets? Do you look at the scriptures of the prophets and get excited when you see those ones concerning Christ's first coming? Indeed, they are exciting. But do you study and try to understand the scriptures of the prophets concerning his second coming? That's the one that's coming up next for us. Verse 25 of chapter 1, book of Acts. That he may take part of this ministry, they are choosing a substitute now for Judas, of this ministry and apostleship, from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. There was a very special place in hell prepared for Judas. Reprobation is a difficult doctrine, and I think it should make all of us tremble. Let me ask you a question that you've heard me ask many times. Are you saved? So how has it changed your life? The test of reprobation is looking to see if your profession has any fruit. I'm going to read you some verses from Matthew 3, Matthew 7, Matthew 12, Luke 6, John 15. I'll just read straight through them. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Even so every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. It's impossible. Every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Either make a tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by his fruit. For every tree is known by his fruit, for of thorns men do not gather figs, nor of a bramble bush gather they grapes. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. I think the scripture makes it clear that one of the proofs of election is fruit bearing. We find it in the context of election in John chapter 15, just a few verses later. Verse 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. That's pretty clear doctrine of election here. I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. God has foreordained the good works that we should walk in them. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10. Jesus says it here and calls it fruit. I've chosen you. I have ordained you. And what have I ordained? That you would go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit would remain. It's going to be lasting fruit. Romans chapter 6 verse 21 talks about a different kind of fruit. What fruit had ye then in those things whereof you are now ashamed for the end of those things is death. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. The fruit that the Christian bears will be a holy fruit, it will be much fruit, it will be a lasting fruit. 
Paul gives another illustration in Romans chapter 7. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Just as death severs in the eyes of God a marriage bond, Jesus says you are dead to the law. Death has severed you from the law. And so now you're married to Christ, you're not married to the law. And so you're supposed to be bearing fruit, just as a bride bears children for her husband. Notice well what he says in this verse, that law-keeping is not the same thing as fruit-bearing. That's a very important point. Many people who think they are trying to keep the law think they're bearing fruit. But Paul says you're dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Law-keeping is not the same thing as fruit-bearing. So what kind of fruit does God look for in the life of the believer? Fruit that he himself has predestinated. The fruit that he himself produces in the life of the believer, because he's guaranteed he'll do it. I have chosen you and ordained you that you should bring forth fruit, Jesus said. We find it in Galatians 5, verses 22 through 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh. Brings us back to the cross here. Remember, if the princes of the world had known who Jesus was, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory, but God had a purpose in it. We identify with it. They that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. He's given you illustrations of the works of the flesh. He gives you a few more here in that verse 26. And then chapter 5 of Ephesians, just like in Galatians. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness and righteousness and truth. That's the fruit we're supposed to be producing because God has ordained it and God does it. The Holy Spirit does it in the life of people who are truly elect, who are truly saved, and who are walking by faith. How does God accomplish this predestinated fruit? Hebrews 12, 11. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Let's ask another question. How can you be a fruit inspector and know who is a phony? Jude tells us. Jude 1, verse 12. These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you, feeding themselves without fear. Clouds they are without water, carried about of winds. Trees whose fruit withereth. Remember Jesus said, the fruit in the life of the real believer is fruit that abides. The fruit in the life of an apostate is fruit that withers. Without fruit, it withers, it's gone. Twice dead, plucked up by the roots. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. These are trees that are plucked up by the roots. They're not abiding in Christ. They're not part of the vine. In the sovereign plan of God, individuals are chosen for damnation, as well as for heaven. Let me say that again. In the sovereign plan of God, individuals are chosen for damnation as well as being chosen for heaven. Peter says so. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Jesus is the elect and precious cornerstone. Verse 7. Unto you, therefore, which believe, he is precious. 
but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. Now listen to the next two phrases. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. Same thing Jesus said about the disciples, that he had appointed them to bear fruit. And here are those who stumble at the word, whereunto they were appointed. That's set in contrast to our election and appointment in the next two verses. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. We're that chosen generation. This is not a point for being proud or a point for being arrogant and careless, but a point that should make us tremble that there are some who think they're among the elect who in fact have been chosen for damnation. We see additional prophecies related to Judas to his suicide, to specific events surrounding his death. Without realizing they were doing it, the reprobate priests were also specifically fulfilling a prophecy from Jeremiah when Judas betrayed Christ. Jesus had told about it in John 13, verse 18, I speak not of you all, I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled, he that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. Matthew 27, 3, Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself, and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned in that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, So what's that to us? See thou to it. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed, and went out and hanged himself. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for us to put them into the treasury, because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore, that field was called the field of blood until this day. Then was fulfilled, they're fulfilling prophecy and they're not even knowing it. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of them that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord appointed me. They fulfilled the prophecies without even knowing they were doing it. Other prophecies that the reprobate Jewish leaders and the pagan Gentiles fulfilled included many of them. I'll read you just a few. First from Matthew 26, and then Matthew 27, then John 19, Mark 15, Again, John 19, John 15, John 18. Let me just read them through. And behold, one of them which were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck a servant of the high priest and smote off his ear. Then said Jesus unto him, Put up again thy sword into his place, for all they that take the sword shall perish with the sword. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? There's another insight into what would have happened if Jesus had chosen to do something different than he chose to do. He would have been delivered. A legion was approximately 6,000 men. Jesus says, I can ask for 12 legions of angels right now and get them. That's 72,000 angels minimum. Do you think that 72,000 angels flaming out of heaven could have beaten back this motley band that came across the valley to the Mount of Olives from the high priest to capture Jesus? Do you think the angels would have won? You know they would. Jesus specifically chose not 
to call for the angels so that he could fulfill the scriptures. They were doing what the scriptures prophesied would be done to the Messiah. In that same hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, Are you come out as against the thief with swords and staves for to take me? I sat daily with you teaching in the temple, and ye laid no hold on me. But all this was done, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And you know what happens next? The congregation runs out in a mad panic. <laughs> then all the disciples forsook him and fled. The scriptures had prophesied that. And they that laid hold on Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were assembled. One more chapter down. Matthew 27, 35. And they crucified him and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. They heard the prophets read every Sabbath day. And they didn't recognize Christ. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. John makes reference to this also in John 19, 24. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture did they cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now, were those Roman soldiers... Busy studying their Bibles and saying, let's see what comes next. What are we supposed to do next so that we can fulfill Bible prophecy? They're unsaved, they're pagans, they're Gentiles. But the scripture prophesied that small band of men doing precisely what that small band of men did. Matthew chapter 15, verse 27 and 28. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand and the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled with Seth, and he was numbered with the transgressors. Do you think that when this group of three was sent out to be crucified, that Pilate knew he was fulfilling scripture? That the soldiers, when they nailed them up, had them in that specific order with a thief on each side because they wanted to try to fulfill what the Bible was prophesying. That what the thieves said on the cross, they said because they thought back, you know, I remember when I was a little kid, you know, in the synagogue, and then when I was working uh, to get my bar mitzvah, uh, I remember reading this passage, and I guess I'm one of the thieves that ought to be saying something right now, so this is what I think I'll say. Do you think that was the case? These are people who do not know that they are fulfilling Scripture. John 19, 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the Scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. You see how many things happened at the time of the crucifixion? There were actually specific prophecies from the Old Testament. John 19, 33 and following. But when, one came, when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Two different places in the Old Testament all coming together at one point. John 15, 25. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. John 18, 29 and 30. Then went Pilate out unto them and said, What accusation bring you against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death, that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled which he spake, signifying what death 
he should die. Do we see God-haters actually fulfilling Bible prophecy? Yes. And we see that among those God-haters fulfilling Bible prophecy were those who were among the reprobate who had specifically been chosen, such as Judas, for eternal damnation, but God placed them at a specific point in history to fulfill the prophetic scriptures that he had ordained so that in the end he would receive the greatest amount of glory and his people would receive the greatest amount of good and these people did not even know it. They thought they were the elect. Dear friends, that should cause us to tremble. Do you know for sure you're elect? That you are not one of the reprobate as we read a few moments ago? Are you bearing fruit, not merely fulfilling works of the law? Are you bearing fruit? The fruit of the Spirit. Jesus said that he guaranteed he not only had called us to bear fruit, but he's ordained it. And he's ordained that we should bear much fruit. And he tells us what the fruit is in Galatians 5. And he tells us that it will be in holiness. And he tells us that it will be in righteousness. Are you bearing fruit? Examine your own selves. See that whether or not you're in the faith or whether or not you be reprobate. That's our warning. Some are appointed to wrath and others are not. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 For God has not appointed us to wrath, but to salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. For the seriousness of your word, the sobering thoughts that here we are teetering on the brink of eternity, merrily going on our way, assuming things that perhaps are not true, because there is no fruit, nothing to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit which you have guaranteed will show up in the life of every Christian. Father, please help us to examine ourselves, whether or not we are in the faith. Again, we thank you for your word, for its power. We thank you for the prophetic scriptures, not only of the first coming of Christ, but also the prophetic scriptures concerning his second coming, concerning the things to come, the things that are a great joy and blessing to think about. The things to come also include the judgments the wrath of the Lamb, the lake of fire. Father, if there's anyone here or listening to this message over the internet or at a later date who does not know Jesus Christ as his or her Savior, we pray that you will take your word and that it will not return void unto you, but that it will accomplish that which you please and prosper in the thing whereto you have sent it and that by your word you will irresistibly draw those who hear to Christ. For we pray it in his name. Amen. Our closing hymn for tonight.